What's up guys, Ebert here with Hurricane X and welcome back to another video. Ryzen 5 was just launched a few days ago and we've tested two of the most anticipated CPUs in that lineup, the 1500X and the 1600X. If you're looking for in-depth benchmarks, uh, you can watch our Ryzen 5 review video right here or I'll link that and our written article in the description for you to check out later. Now in our review video, I mentioned how Ryzen 5 is a great foundation to build an amazing system and I did that. Now, before everyone starts raging upon how Intel CPUs can help yield higher frame rates, uh, think about it this way. With Ryzen 5, you're not only getting fantastic multi-thread performance and somewhat better frame rates compared to its much expensive brother, the 1800X, uh, but you're also getting it in a relatively inexpensive package. Uh, building a system featuring a Z270 motherboard and an unlocked i5 or i7 processor can become expensive. This build is $1,100 and it can render 4K videos just as fast as my 6-core 4930K workstation PC. Uh, and it's also a pretty capable gaming PC too. Um, but we'll get into the details right after this. Cooler Master Master Keys keyboard lineup is now available in three sizes to fit within your space with large, medium, and small boards with either beautiful RGB or pure white LED illumination. A little something for everyone. Make it yours with the Master Keys Pro by Cooler Master. So the heart of the system, aka the brain used for all that processing power is the Ryzen 5 1600X 6-core 12 threaded processor. At $250, this CPU offers excellent performance for multi-threaded workloads like content creation, streaming games, crunching in complex numbers, you name it. Plus, with a base clock of 3.6 GHz, it should play well with games and since it comes unlocked, you might be able to squeeze out some more performance. Cooling this 6-core beast would be the Wraith Max stock cooler that AMD sent us. Now, I need to highly emphasize that the 1600X does not come with a CPU cooler. This was actually from the Ryzen 7 kit that AMD sent us and it was the only AM4 compatible cooler I had in hand. Do I find anything interesting about it? Nothing to be honest. You get the same heatsink design from AMD's previous coolers, but they've added a touch of RGB by implementing this ring around the fan and it looks quite unique. Also remember that AM4 is a fairly new platform, so aftermarket cooling solutions are working on providing uh, mounting brackets to support this platform. Some companies are even offering their kits or their respective kits for free of charge if you happen to own an existing AIO or an air cooler. Uh, if you're looking for a cheaper alternative, the Cooler Master Hyper 212 EVO can be picked up for $30 and you can request for the AM4 kit from their website. Housing the 1600X is the ASUS Prime B350 Plus motherboard. For $100, it packs a lot of features like an NVMe 4X M.2 slot, two native USB 3.1 Gen 2 back panel connectors, and six SATA 6 gigabits per second ports. Most importantly, it supports Crossfire, but not SLI. I would highly recommend a single GPU solution because if you plan on going Crossfire or SLI along with adding third-party PCI cards on top of that, you might want to step things up to the X370 chipset to take advantage of those PCI lane speeds, and that would obviously add cost. This board does support overclocking, which is pretty awesome, plus the four DDR4 memory DIMMs support up to 64 gigabytes of RAM that can be operated at 3200 MHz. Also, check this out. This board features an RGB fan header, meaning if you end up picking up one of AMD's Wraith coolers with the RGB ring, you can control the LEDs through the AI Suite app, which is pretty nice. For memory, we opted for G-Skill's Ripjaws 16GB DDR4 kit clocked at 2400MHz, and it should be plenty enough for gaming and a little bit of video editing. Now, memory prices have increased a little bit over the past few months, and this was the cheapest we were able to find coming in at $120. As a bonus, the modules are red, so it should definitely help with the red and black combo because the B350 board features the exact same color scheme, and as mentioned earlier, this motherboard supports up to 64 gigabytes of RAM, so you can easily upgrade down the road. Let's talk storage. We chose the OCZ TL100 240GB SSD as our main boot drive. While it may not be anywhere near as fast as an NVMe M.2 drive, it still provides excellent performance and great longevity while costing about $80. And also don't forget the fact that this drive is backed up by a three-year advanced warranty program, which is awesome. Now, I know 240GB isn't enough to store all your game library, so I decided to throw a 4TB Western Digital Blue Drive for expansion, but if you're on a tight budget, there are cheaper 1TB alternatives that can do the job really well. Our GPU of choice goes to the Strix RX 480 8GB Overclocked Edition. Since this is a build featuring a Ryzen 5 CPU, I thought it was best to include a GPU from the same team, and this one made our list. 
The Strix cooler is by far one of the best aftermarket cooling solutions we've ever come across on a GPU. It features three wing blade zero dB fans, meaning during idle, they completely stop spinning, and the direct CU3 heat pipes should definitely help with lower temperatures while gaming. It also features RGB lighting that can be controlled through the GPU tweak software, plus at $270, this should play well with 1080p gaming because the core clock gets all the way up to 1330 MHz. Our case of choice might seem a little intimidating, but there's a reason for that. The Corsair Spec Alpha was sitting in my living room for almost four months now, and I had to put it to some good use. Luckily, it features red and black accents throughout the chassis, so it fits perfectly with the color scheme that we're going for in the first place, and it costs $80. Now, many of you guys would say that the Fantex P400S looks a lot better, offers a lot more features, and costs exactly the same as the Spec Alpha, which is $80. And I would agree with you guys, because I would actually pick the Fantex case over the Spec Alpha any time of the day. But like I said, this guy was taking up space in my living room, uh, so it was, and it was the only option I had, so yeah. Powering the whole PC is the Silverstone Strider Plus 500 watt fully modular power supply. It comes with an 80 plus bronze certification and given its excellent modularity and extra wattage headroom, you can easily upgrade to a faster GPU that requires more power. Once again, alternatives are always welcome, but this was something I had lying around in the studio. So that's a total of two components put to good use. So with all parts out of the way, let's build our first Ryzen 5 system. Well, here's the final system in all its glory. I'm actually pretty happy with the final result. The case obviously is an interesting aspect about this build and I'm sure many of you would start raging about it in the comments, so I'm looking forward to that. The one thing that stands out the most is the cable mess uh, at the bottom right in front of the power supply. I wish Corsair included a separate power shroud to hide them, plus the lack of rubber grommets right beside the motherboard tray is disappointing. On a positive note, they include two red LED intake fans that perfectly match the color scheme and the front I.O. panel covers all the essentials you need like two USB 3.0 ports and dedicated headphones slash mic jacks. The Wraith Max cooler looks gorgeous with the RGB LED ring, plus it adds some character to the Ryzen build. All right, so let's see how the system performs. Uh, I left the 1600X at stock settings and the RX 480 was set to OC mode through the GPU tweak software and here's what I got. I rendered our standard 1 minute 4K video using Premiere Pro CC 2017 and the Ryzen 5 build rendered the clip 12 seconds longer than my workstation PC. It's not a huge difference to be honest and this can vary heavily upon the GPU of choice as well. In this case with the RX 480 I was able to play back native 4K GH4 files within Premiere and the GPU was utilizing well over 90%. If I were to throw in a GTX 1060, 1070 or 1080. The results may vary because Premiere Pro works really well with CUDA. CPU temperatures were respectable. Out of the box, the 1600X ran about 39C during idle and under load, it was reaching about 67C and this was monitored through the Ryzen Master software. Now onto gaming. Battlefield 1 at 1080p set to high averaged well over 90 frames per second and dipped into the low 80s. Overwatch at 1080p set to Ultra averaged about 87 frames per second and dished out minimums in the low 70s. Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Violence, which is a slightly more demanding title, taxed out in the ARCs 480, averaging just a tad over 60 frames per second and dipping in the high 40s. The Strix ARCs 480 was running at a constant 1330 MHz with temperatures reaching just below 70C and I did not experience throttling whatsoever. Oh hey there. NCX.com is Canada's leading e-tailer for anything your mind desires. Just keep within those categories, which are plenty, and get tempted by the weekly deals. Visit NCX.com for all them sweet deals.
So there you have it, our first Ryzen 5 build featuring the brand new 1600X from AMD. Now, this is not the end for our performance analysis of these newer CPUs because we will be doing a video on how overclocking a CPU can impact gaming performance. Uh, we're also expecting a microcode update from AMD in a few weeks, so hopefully that will help us get better frame rates. You never know. Anyway, guys, I want to hear your thoughts about this build, whether if you hated it or if you loved it. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading those responses in the comments. Uh, I'm Ebro with Harvard Connects. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.